My name is John Pittman. I'm the music director for Portland's listener-supported all-classical radio, all-classical FM. And welcome to Concert Conversations, a partnership between All Classical and the Oregon Symphony. And joining me this evening is our music director and conductor, Carlos Calmar. Please welcome him. Good evening to everybody. Hi. Carlos, I was driving in listening to our favorite radio station. You and, do the same as I do. Yeah, I think so. I'm addicted. Yeah. And what is playing with the Chicago Symphony under High Tink doing? Beethoven's Seventh Symphony. So it just got me right into that Beethoven groove for tonight. I'm sure that <laughs> after this weekend, you cannot hear Beethoven for at least three days. <laughs> I have to go off to a spa somewhere yeah. in the mountains and <laughs> detox from too much Beethoven. If you imagine that actually Beethoven's music, which we all really adore, has been used in a movie to torture somebody. Does anybody here know what movie I'm talking about? Clockwork Orange, Stanley Kubrick. My good Lud Ludwig van. <laughs> Ludwig van. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But we are not going to do that to you today. <laughs> no torture at all. No. In fact, I feel like I'm walking into some temple of, of adoration of Beethoven tonight. Well, in music, it, <laughs> there are... When you start thinking about the best piano concertos uh, written, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's hard to even be judgmental, but um, the five Beethoven concertos are right there. The problem with being judgmental and saying these are the best concerts for piano ever written is that there is this Austrian guy called Mozart who wrote a couple of them that are very good, and then there is Brahms and there are others. And let's not forget that actually Rachmaninoff wrote nice piano concertos, which we all like too. So, but it, all in all, considering we are presenting all the uh, five piano concertos, and I guess that the evening, at least our concert conversation, could be in part about the Beethoven's mismanagement of numbers, because... <laughs> Leonora number three, the overture you're hearing tonight is not Leonora three, and Beethoven piano concerto number two is for sure not Beethoven piano concerto number two. And I've already confused you. <laughs> I mean, it's very simple. Leonora uh, overture number three is actually the second he wrote, not the third. Okay. Okay. And Beethoven's piano concerto number two was written before Beethoven Piano Concerto Number One. It's only when things were published, that's how it works. So that's kind of the start. Yeah. Yes. Now you, you decided that we needed to have a Beethoven Festival. Why now? And question number two, this could have been a Beethoven Festival where you could have cherry-picked a symphony, a concerto, let's throw in an overture. Maybe some arias, but this is a focus on one particular area, one particular output of Beethoven's well, I, I, work. Just to start with the idea of why now, I cannot answer that other than asking you, why not now? <laughs> um, and uh, the idea of having all the Beethoven concertos uh, in a row uh, or on a big weekend is actually has something to do with maybe if you even think about the evolution that this composer had, starting with Beethoven Concerto number two, ending with the Emperor, the number five, and you see how Beethoven evolved in his piano playing and how the concerti got more mature, bigger, even to a certain extent more meaningful, and how very soon after number two, which was the first one he wrote, uh, he kind of um, got himself to be Beethoven only. Number two is a concerto that is be very Beethoven, but I mean, it's like looking over the shoulder and feeling that guy over there, Mozart, uh, 
<laughs> looking over his shoulder and saying, this is how you write a piano concerto. So it's very much influenced. And we just decided to present all of that because, matter of fact, uh, we also, it had something to do with um, the willingness of our soloist. Uh, when Arnaldo was here last time and he played Liszt piano concerto number two and everybody went wild. The audience went wild. We adored him. He's a fantastic player. So we talked to him and said, okay, well, Arnaldo, what's next? And uh, he had more than only one idea. And actually, I must say that he wasn't the one floating the idea of all five Beethovens. It was me. Uh, I said, hey, Arnaldo, have you ever thought of performing all five Beethovens? And he said, well, actually, I've done that, I think, two or three times in his life. So he was thinking, well, yeah, sure. And then I, asked, uh, then I said to him, and by the way, what do you think? Can we also do the triple? Because you only play five concertos in three nights. You're not really busy. L let, let's, do, let's do something different. And he said, uh, okay. And there he is. And he's, I mean, Arnaldo is a, is a very well-known uh, incredible pianist, wonderful pianistic skills, can play pretty much everything in the repertoire. He's n not one of those pianists whom you kind of limit to a certain side of the repertoire. And he also has, aside from being Brazilian, um, he has extremely strong links to America. I think he, it's kind of the same story as my, my own, which is, yes, he's from a different country, but I actually spent more, by far, more time in America than anywhere else. And he uh, spends quite a bit of time in uh, Bloomington, Indiana. He's on faculty there, uh, amongst others, and playing all over the world. Um, my colleague, Krista Wessel, uh, had a wonderful interview with uh, Arnaldo Cohen for Northwest Previews on Thursday night, and I listened back to that recording today. And uh, he was talking about how he is, he kind of feels uh, that you both share some of that South American blood. And, uh, you, you know, you have, that's just, that's on one level that you can relate to one another besides the musical level, of course. Well, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, in a way, uh, it's, it's interesting because I always would say, first of all, South America, South America is a large continent, boy. And in a way, without dividing the continent, but the Brazilians, the Argentinians, and the Uruguayans, that is kind of, they relate very well to each other. And, and that's how it works. A aside from the fact that actually every Brazilian there is has to kind of, during his lifetime, learn the basics of the language that we all speak in South America because Brazilians speak Portuguese and we are, we Spanish speaking human beings are not willing to learn that language. So yeah, so it's kind of <laughs> a mixture and uh, Arnaldo is very good at that. And, and yes, we communicate very, very well. Yeah. Well, he's taking on really an Olympian feat here in doing these. He said he's done it before, but it yes. still can't be the easiest thing to do. Three nights, five different concertos, six actually, if you count the triple concerto. Um, you know, it's, it's really a treat for us as well as being a challenge for him. Well, I was thinking about that because um, what you might find in, 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 in subscription or in other concerts or in specials like this weekend is, is some pianists playing the Rachmaninoff piano concertos all three, in three consecutive nights, which is already a huge undertaking. But we are here talking about, how can I say this gently? Um, in Rachmaninoff, the good news is if you don't play all the notes, I mean, I'm not saying that anybody of these wonderful pianists does that, but if you don't, Nobody's really going to notice because it's so, so complex writing and so many. Once I accompanied a, a, a soloist and he said that uh, he once counted the notes written in Rachmaninoff's third piano concerto, which is the biggest, 
and it came up with a number like 32,000 notes. You have to play in one evening. And if you only play 31,780, I think you're fine. <laughs> in Beethoven, it's different. Uh, because you miss one, oh, it's, it's, that's where Beethoven is a step further in terms of how to treat a piano, but it's still a little bit like Mozart. Mozart, you miss a note and everybody in the hall notices. And Rachmaninoff, you miss a note and you might get away, at least with the 150 in a concert of uh, 30,000 notes. That might be because in the case of both composers, especially in the slow movements, that the melodies are what's carrying us through those passages, not, uh, not passage work or a lot of there intricate, is, uh, intricate th work. Th that's exactly the point. Yeah. There is not so much uh, happening in the middle range. And in a w you can argue, it's the, the old argument that we all have in music, uh, what is more difficult, uh, late romantic music, uh, which is undoubtedly more complex, and the, the, the writing is way richer, or the classicals, meaning uh, the Haydn's, the Mozart's, the Beethoven's. And technically speaking, there is not even a question. Rachmaninoff, for us conductors, just to throw one name out there, Mahler. Yes, more difficult, but musically speaking, it's clear. It's way more difficult to play Beethoven well than to play or Rachmaninoff or conduct Mahler because um, these composers, the later ones, um, give you so much help, oh. meaning they write very complex scores and then they write in the scores exactly what you have to do at which time at which speed and so on and so on and if you have the technical skills you kind of are already at a let's say mediocre level if you have the technical skills you do not arrive anywhere with uh, playing Beethoven because we are all looking and we I think we all deserve something very very special a speaking language, a very special tone, an approach to stylistic issues, and so on and so on. Now, having said that, now as we are starting uh, the, the, the piano concerto, uh, with piano concerto number two, that actually um, is a piano concerto that is written under the influence of Mozart. It, um, matter of fact, I have seen and I have conducted Mozart piano concertos that actually start exactly the same way as this one starts. Meaning, pianist sits down, orchestra puts out the entire material for the first movement, pianist starts with, and it always sounds like the pianist starts the first five bars as if he is in the middle of a phrase. And that is something that Mozart does pretty much, pretty much everywhere. There are a few exceptions. So that's where it comes. Also, if you are as lucky as staying with us over the next three nights, you will see that the instrumentation of the concerts change. This concert, uh, the number two, which is Beethoven's number one, is the only piano concerto uh, where there are no timpani and no trumpets. It's the smallest of all. Instrumentation is very light. It has a certain touch of classicism mm. to it. And it lacks, for some part, the thing that we all adore about Beethoven, which is great melodies, but a lot of drama. Beethoven is always drama. <laughs> this is young Beethoven. This is Beethoven already establishing himself as a virtuoso pianist, um, arrive, arriving in, in Vienna eventually from his native Bonn. Um, but that concerto number two, he had worked on for a number of years. And then in the meantime, he set about writing his C major concerto. So he went ahead and published that, called it number one. Um, and then he came back um, with the material of concerto number two and told the publisher call this concerto number two even though it had actually been written and already debuted sometime before the C major 
it's when you read about the, the evolution, for example, specifically of, of this uh, piano concerto, <laughs> and like I am, you are responsible here and there for premiering, conducting a world premiere of a piece. You cannot imagine what was possible back then and what we would not even accept, don't even think about it. Allegedly, two days before the premiere of the piece, Beethoven hadn't written out the piano part yet, at all. And by the premiere, it was not done yet. Beethoven, because he was a little bit, uh, there were some health issues with him in his house in Vienna. He had several copyists waiting for the maestro finally to finalize another page of the score so that they can write it again and then they can present it to an orchestra. Nowadays, we have a world premiere and if the composer doesn't turn uh, uh, over the music at least three months in advance, we are going to say, sorry, we're not going to play your piece. And back then, two days before the premiere, the, the ink was still wet and they still did it. I and think he mostly improvised the part at the, at the premiere. Yeah, he wrote actually yeah. the, the part of the premiere he wrote years later. Yeah. He finally wrote it down, La years after the, the concert was uh, premiered. And he even apologized to his publisher for scribbling. And I don't know if any of, one of you have ever run over uh, a manuscript of Beethoven or manuscript of any composer, because there are differences. Haydn, very clean. Mozart, also very legible, no errors. Beethoven, it's all over the map. You cannot even, I mean, I know the pieces and I somehow look at them and think like, what? And then there is ink and crossings and this knot and that knot and red ink. It, it's a puzzle. And that, had, and that is difficult for us to read and we know the piece. And how difficult must that have been in times when Beethoven, I mean, nobody knew what was coming. So it's, it's great work by the publisher. Yeah. So that concerto in B-flat major is a, is a kind of product of his Mozartian influence. He had studied with Haydn, although that didn't go well. It, they, they didn't get along very well. Uh, but still, it, it comes out of that period. Exactly. Well, he, who yeah. did get along with Beethoven anyway? <laughs> Even as a young man, I guess he could, yeah. be, he could be difficult. But your concert's going to open with a piece that plunges us right into the middle period. Beethoven's creativity is known as, as being across three distinct periods, early, middle, and late. And Leonore Overture, being attached to Fidelio, is one of the central and very important pieces um, of that composer from what they call the middle period. He's established himself in Vienna by this time, and he's written several symphonies. And about the same time, he had written the fourth symphony. I think and, that's the fourth was, symphony, yeah, right yeah, there. And he was moving along in the concertos and so forth, too. So, but he, he struggled at this piece just as he did with so many others. Well, he's, uh, this is probably the piece he struggled the most in his lifetime because um, <clears throat> Beethoven, interesting enough, was not an opera composer, although he's a very dramatic composer. But opera didn't come to him lightly, and he wrote so many years on this opera. <laughs> and in the end, he wrote four overtures which is, if you look side by side, a composer like Beethoven and a composer like, let's say, Rossini, Ross, Beethoven writes one opera during his lifetime, struggles with it, writes four different overtures, three he calls Leonora, one he calls Fidelio. Allegedly, he made sketches for a Leonora number four, but, well, we can skip that. Rossini, on the other side, is able to write two operas, sometimes up to three uh, per year. And he sometimes is so busy that he writes one opera that is going to be used in several operas at the same time. Uh, overture I mean, in several Overture, operas. sorry. I mean, uh, all of you, if you just have been uh, over to our friends at the opera and have just have just seen Barber of Sevilla, 
the overture, this wonderful piece of music, the overture to Barbar of Sevilla, is not only the overture to Barbar of Sevilla, it's used in a different opera too, because how can you manage to write so many operas? Anyway, now, um, because I said Leonora 3 is actually number two, true. First of all, the opera was called Leonore, the one that we know as Fidelio. Uh, it was published and premiered with uh, Leonora Overture number two. Just to make confusion complete, not successful. Next attempt, uh, I think it was two years later, 1806, second attempt, let's play it again. Overture was now the one you're going to hear tonight, which is labeled as number three. Didn't go well either. And way later, he wrote an overture that actually has not much to do with the number two and three that he called number one. And even in the year 1814, when the final version of this opera happened, he wrote the overture number four, which is called Fidelio. And by the way, the, the reason why this opera is called Fidelio is because there was already an you know, opera by uh, the composer Ferdinando Part uh, with the name of Leonore. So just not to confuse everybody, but I'm confusing any, everybody anyway, saying number two is number, oh God. The, <laughs> We are not going to, when you go out the hall, we are not going to test you and examine you whether you remember which one is which. Just enjoy it. But what, the one main distinction between any of the Leonore overtures and the Fidelio is that the Fidelio contains material that doesn't even appear in the opera. It's just a, a lively curtain raiser. Whereas Leonora quotes a very important aria that's sung by the man Flo who's in prison, Floristan. Floristan. Yeah. And there's a horn signal, a horn call, that in the opera is meant to signal the arrival of the woman who's going to rescue him. And so those are some, isn't that right? Not quite it? Just to, because I'm... Portland so Opera did lay in uh, Fidelia a few years ago too, so okay. <laughs> should know this you, better. You, no, no, you, you, you know it well. Uh, it's not a horn, it's a trumpet, and it signals okay. the arrival of the minister, not of Leonor. Do you know the story of Leonora, meaning Fidelio? I mean, it's a guy, Florestan, young guy, falsely imprisoned by the director of a prison. And uh, to save him, his wife disguises herself as a young man and works as a prison ward. And when it comes the time in the second act, big drama in the dungeon deep down in the prison, that Pizarro, the director of the prison, the evil man, comes down to kill the young man. Uh, just Leonora steps between them with a pistol, and at that moment this wonderful uh, trumpet call happens, announcing that the minister has just arrived and everybody should come up. Uh, and, um, well, end of story is... The director of the prison goes to prison, Florestan is freed, everybody's happy. We can go, to, we can, we can go home very happily. Now, um, the overture number three that you're going to hear tonight and the overture number two that you're going to hear num Monday are very similar. And they have both, they go very clearly beyond the idea of uh, an overture. They are longer and they have way more material. It, it, it kind of works like a symphonic poem, meaning like a little opera by itself. And it's so great. It is so great music that it has been made a tradition that whenever a Fidelio by Beethoven is staged, or let's say most of the time, between Act 1 and Act 2, the, the overture you're going to hear tonight is placed there because the Act 1 plays in the prison and the Act 2 plays actually in the patio of the prison, but there is natural light and stuff like that. And kind of to make this transition from darkness to light very clear, we all used 
uh, Leonora number three. Okay, uh, Maestro, we have about four minutes or so. We'll come we up. have one more big piece to talk about. Oh yeah. That'd... Now the Leonora Overture and the Triple Concerto both date from what uh, from that middle period of Beethoven. Beethoven had a good friend named Archduke Rudolf of Austria, and he was an amateur pianist. There was also a very good violinist and a very good cellist who were friends of Beethoven, and it was apparently for these three individuals that Beethoven composed the Triple Concerto that we're going to hear tonight. Uh, kind of a, an outgrowth of Mozart and Haydn's era of writing a piece for multiple soloists and orchestra. Uh, so he's kind of reviving that tradition. Um, but also, um, it, the piece I would imagine is being written in accordance with the abilities of those, those three gentlemen. Well, do you think that's accurate? It's very likely, and it, it shows again the genius of Beethoven. Um, the triple concerto you're going to hear tonight is not wildly popular. It's not being played over and over and over again, like at least some of the piano concertos by Beethoven. But it's a very good piece of music that poses certain problems for, actually, the composer. Um, you could imagine, actually, that this concerto comes out of the tradition that we had in the Baroque era, which is called the Concerto Grosso, where you have an orchestra and just the leading people in the orchestra play solos here and there. Not that, this is not the case. This is very clearly a concerto for piano trio and an orchestra. And now the problem is this. You put them here on the stage, you surround them with a, let's say, mid-sized bit of an orchestra. What will happen, likely? The piano will be heard very well. The, the, the violin will be heard quite okay, and nobody's going to hear the cello, oh. because it's the darker instrument. And whenever uh, a piano does a lot of chordal work, I mean, it's... It's, it's a percussive instrument, it makes a lot of noise. So what does Beethoven, also taking into consideration that he wrote this probably for the Archduke who wasn't a genius on the piano. He was a very fair player. The piano part in the triple concerto is the easiest of all three and has in a way most of the time complement work. The violin is already um, it's difficult, it's challenging, but the cello part is complete insanity. And it's really difficult to play. And Beethoven kind of shushing the piano makes one trick. He gives a lot of the melodies to the cello and lets the, lets the cello play very high up in the range so that the sound projects better into the hall. It's quite the strike of a genius to do that that way. So whenever, uh, in a way jokingly, you can argue that whenever you have the, 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 the Beethoven triple concerto played by soloists who do not work as a piano trio, I always look at who the cellist is first, because that, whoever that is, is going to be really in trouble all the time. Now we, got, we are very lucky because Arnaldo is playing anyway and uh, the wonderful Dutch cellist who was with us last weekend in the Dvorak Cello Concerto, Kirin Fiersen, is going to play the cello and our great concert master Juni Wasaki is going to be the violinist. So, I mean, it's very clear you are in for a good treat. It certainly sounds like it. Carlos Kalmar, thank you very much. Looking John, forward to it. A pleasure. All right, thank you for coming.